Well, welcome to our preparedness class tonight. Uh, we're excited to have John Kazir here. He's, he's the expert. Of course, he's our water master in the valley. No better person than to talk, talk about the water issues. So it's, we're excited to have him here. We always begin these uh, preparedness classes with a prayer. That's been our tradition. Uh, Jody, would you offer a prayer for us? Sure. And then we'll turn the time to John. Father, we're thankful for this day. Thank you for the help that you've given us. Thank you for this talent. And ask for thy spirit to be with us. Help guide us make, to make good choices and help us to uh, help other people and be self-reliant. And uh, thankful for thy son, Jesus Christ. And help us think of him often. Name of Jesus, name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Hey, John. Thank you. Um, I don't know where to start. These are kind of the items that we can cover. We may not have enough time. Uh, I think we go about an hour. Is that right? So um, as we get to discussing it, if you see the time's failing and you've got something that you really want to talk about. That's why I wrote it here is uh, in, anybody who might be online. Uh, can chime in and we'll move to we these are in no necessarily no order no uh, priority but I thought we'd just start out on personal water storage quantities kind of start there on the on the left and talk about those because this is how I mean at the end of the day you as a person need to know how do I get water and how do I make sure it's safe to drink in the event of an emergency when I can't just turn my faucet on and get water. Whether that's uh, a break inside your home and but still get out of the street, but you just can't use it inside your home. Um, so uh, the first thing I wanna cover is storage. Um, it's kind of important. I hope everybody understands that um, storage needs to be in new unused containers. You can't take your old apple bottles, your old pop bottles, and store water in them. Um, the plastic, whatever was in there originally, uh, the sugars, the all of those things impregnate themselves inside the plastic. And so if you put water in those bottles, you can use the water, but don't, I hope you don't expect to drink it, certainly not straight from the bottle, without some significant um, either purification, chlorination, disinfection to make it usable again. Um, so I encourage you to, if you're going to store, um, you, you've got to start looking at the quantities, right? 55 gallon drum, that might be a little tough to move around. What are you going to do? You're going to do 15 gallons. So you, th this is a personal item, right? What are my capabilities? What do I want to do? Right? So new unused, really storage containers, 55 gallon drums, 15 gallon, uh, they, they have 15 gallon plastic. You'll just want to wash those out really well. And initially you'll want to add some chlorine. We're going to talk about purification, filtration. And I want to spend a little bit of time on that so that people understand how much, because that's always the question, right? How much? And as I read online, there's lots of different things. And I'm going to go through a calculation that's going to look really kind of, we're going to be in parts per million. So we're going to be dealing in millions of pounds of water. We're going to whittle that down to 100 gallons or and hopefully we won't spend a whole lot of time on that but um maybe we can put the calculation out there or and or give some calculations for amounts of water versus chlorine okay so uh the the quantity of storage how how long do you need the water for are you going to be a short-term store there are people who store 2,500 gallons of water, have a big tank in their yard. Um, and I, I, I always come back to the question that I asked last year when we had this meeting was when somebody said, how much water do I store? And I said, well, what do you want to use it for? Right? So you kind of have to break your storage up into like drinking water. What am I going to use for drinking water? And then once I store it for drinking, I've got to have a way to purify because really water age and water quality becomes a problem if you're storing long term. Um, it's suggested that you rotate water for drinking, especially in 
six month intervals no longer. And even at that, you'd be, if it's been several weeks since it's been put away, you're still gonna need to do some uh, disinfection to even just ensure that it's safe. Even if you use a Berkey? So, well, yeah, that's good. We're gonna, I wanted to cover that down in filtration. Yeah. Perfect, You're great, great question, right? Um, because you can store a whole lot of water and then there's a, a, a misconception, I think sometimes that, well, I'll just keep adding chlorine on a six month basis, right? I'll figure out what my chlorine ratio is and I'll just add chlorine. Well, what's happening is, is you add the chlorine and the chlorine evaporates and it grows stuff again. You're creating, it's less a little chemical, uh, a little chemistry project, right? That you're adding chlorine. And so you're creating halocytic acids, uh, trihalomethanes, um, other disinfection byproducts that are extremely harmful. And the longer, the more times you add the chlorine and kill the organics in it, the more concentrated those become. So now you've added chlorine, say 10 times, and you've created all these other chemicals, all these other acids in the water, and it's not safe for drinking. It's good for watering your garden, and that's it. You can bathe in it maybe, um, but you certainly can't cook with it. It's difficult to uh, get those, those acids out, even sometimes with filtration, Laurie. So that's, when you start thinking about storage, start thinking about what am I gonna need to store for, uh, uh, down here, I put using the water, drinking, for bathing and for washing, right? And come up with some idea of what you use. Now, in the wintertime, an average household really uses probably less than 100 gallons a day, and that's with on-demand, turn it on anytime I want, water, okay? About 100 gallons a household, that includes dishwashing, clothes washing, so um, that, and, and that's not a big family. So if you look at your water bill during the wintertime, most people are somewhere right around that 4,000 gallons a month, which is no outdoor water, just indoor water. And those who are uh, retired couples will use less. We've got a few that use less than 2,000 gallons a month because there's no outdoor watering going on in the wintertime. Um, so you, you, that's individual to your family. So basically figure um, the state quantity is 40 gallons per day per capita. So a household is about 2.5 people, 2.6 people. So that's where we come up with that 100 gallons a day, right? That's use it wherever I want, whenever I want, however I want. So storage is a, reduced from that, probably you know 50 gallons or 20 gallons a day um, that you can really probably get by on. And then you just calculate out how many days you think you wanna be that you're the, any one of these emergencies we're gonna talk about over here might put you out of water and calculate a storage volume, right? At uh, 25 or 30 gallons per household per day. Um, so a few 55 gallon drums likely could last you several weeks, right? Um, depending on how you use it. Uh, so anyway, but the most important thing is, and the hardest part is to rotate it. How do I rotate it? I get a 55 gallon drum. What am I gonna do with it now? How do I move that drum? How do I, so, um, if you're storing in larger quantities, you're going to need some way to, pop, to, to pump it really out of those jars into something that's more manageable, right? Um, so let's just move right to purification. Laurie brought up the, the Berkey, right? That's a, I've done a little research on the Berkey. It's a very good way, uh, probably the, one of the most efficient ways to make drinking water. It requires no power, two and a half gallon container. Um, was if you got some time to wait, it produces good, clean, odor-free, non-chemically treated water, right? It removes the E. coli, the cryptosporidium, any of those types of harmful bacterias that will cause you to get sick. And it, if, if the water doesn't smell real great for one reason or another, if you say you're hauling water, it's a really long-term thing and you're hauling water out of a spring that the water might not have a very good odor to or something and, and it's not real good water by any means, uh, it's a great option uh, for you in, as, as purification. Um, there are other filters that you can use. We in Diamond Valley have, um, our water is high in iron and so we get an iron bacteria. So long-term storage of water in Diamond Valley produces the iron bacteria 
comes from a kind of a suspended type into a solid when it oxidizes, right? So once you take it out of the ground, it oxidizes in oxygen. And that's, you, if you pull your toilet tank, right? You'll see little brown stuff in there. That's from the iron oxidizing. And Robert's our chemist. <laughs> and I don't remember which is which, ferrous and ferric, right? I think ferric is oxidized and ferrous is still suspended. So there are two types, right? Um, yeah. Yep. So iron, um, we, we have a little higher content. One of the things that we don't do in Diamond Valley, which would, if you add chlorine, so St. George City adds chlorine to their water. So what does it do? It oxidizes the iron, but it turns the ferrous into ferric and it settles out into the bottom of the tank. We've chosen not to chlorinate. So that iron now, if it oxidizes, it'll oxidize inside the tank, um, but it's still suspended largely as it enters into the distribution system. And that goes into your homes and can oxidize in your water heaters, other places inside your home. So living here with no chlorination comes with a cost. And the cost is, is that you have to be careful and do your backside flushing of your meters and keep your lines clean because that does build up on the pipe walls, no matter where that post pipes are in the main system, in your individual homes, uh, again, in your, your hot water heaters, your water softeners. And water softeners will get some of that iron out. So if you have a, a water softener, they it oxidizes against the media in, in the uh, water softener. Um, so uh, there, there are other any other filtration things that, I mean, I'm kind of talking, being able to provide water for a home, um, not survival, I'm out in the wilderness and I've got this straw, right? Um, Okay, instead of chlorine, how about the nano silver? Uh, I am not familiar with the chemistry and how that works, Sandra, so I wouldn't be able to speak authoritatively on it. Um, purification is all about oxidation, really. It's uh, any anything that's an oxidizer, uh, chlorine gas is oxygen, right? That's why you can use, um, you could use like hydrogen peroxide, right? You wouldn't, it would work because it has a free oxygen molecule that oxidizes and it takes the, it creates hydrogen gas. Anyway, um, again, we're just, we're just changing ions. And so with, I've never, I'd have to look into the nano silver to know whether it actually will. My understanding is that it does, um, but I don't know anything more about it, dilution rates, et cetera. Okay. Um, okay, how much benefit from running it through a coffee filter? Zero. Okay. <laughs> Carbon. Carbon filter will not remove any of the harmful bacteria, but it will make it taste and smell better. Carbon filters are just taste and smell, what we call taste and odor number. So that's... A lot of the RO has like four filters. Okay, so RO will work. Yep. RO is an effective way. Problem is it takes pressure to run it through an RO, right? That's not the story. So you would need, it's possible, you just need a pump, right? Some pump that you could hook to your RO, create about 30 pounds pressure, and it'll push it through. So that is an option if you thought you wanted to be able to disconnect your RO and hook it to a pump that came out of a five gallon bucket or something and run through your RO under your sink. Certainly an option, but you'd need to, you need a pump and you need power to do that. So RO is a, RO is a great one. They, it's, yeah. Um, and everybody has it in their homes, but connecting it to a pump could be a little problematic in an emergency if you're we'll not prepared. You <laughs> What's that? We'll call you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so filter purification. Um, we talked about the Berkey. Of course, boiling is an option. It takes a, a fair amount of energy to boil water. You need to boil it for about six minutes before you drink it. it takes some time. Uh, so that's a bit of a, a time consuming process. It takes a lot, again, it takes a lot of energy. Um, and probably the most common, easy way to make sure that you've got water if you just kind of in a, in a pinch is chlorination, right? 
So how much chlorine, how, how do I dose chlorine, right? So um, again, we're, we're talking about parts per million. So the state, if you wanna drink it, the state, the EPA, says that the maximum contaminant is for long-term is four parts per million. So that's a pretty low dose, right? If, um, if I've got a 55 gallon drum of water and, and I do dose it to four parts per million, I'm gonna need a little time for contact time because the lower the dose, the longer the contact time, right? If I put a bunch of chlorine in there and shake it up, it's gonna be safe to drink almost immediately. However, you wouldn't want to drink it, right? So now you're gonna be waiting for the chlorine to evaporate and it will, it'll evaporate eventually. Um, but so, so let's talk about dosing and I'm going to, uh, I wish I'd have done this prior, but um, if, if we want a um, common household bleach is 5% chlorine, okay? So uh, in, in a gallon of bleach, it just turns out that there's a half a pound of chlorine in a full bottle. I don't, yeah, you see those blue buckets back there? That's what we use for disinfection when we need to do disinfecting. That's 12% chlorine. And the reason why it's 12% is because of one pound of chlorine in every, in five, in five gallons. Yeah, in one gallon. So there's five pounds of chlorine in that right there. So I can, at one part per million, I can put one bottle in a million pounds of water, right? So um, what, how much is a million, how many gallons is a million pounds of water, okay? So let's figure that out first, okay? So water weighs, come on, Sandra, 8.34 8 8 pounds per gallon, right? So um, a million pounds, we've got the calculator. Um, one hundred and twenty-eight something. Eight point what? It's a hundred and we'll just for, for ease, we'll just call it a hundred and twenty thousand gallon. 120,000 gallons of water because it's 119,904 gallons. So, okay, so if I have a pound of chlorine, that's gonna go, one part per million is gonna go in 120,000 gallons. How big is your tank? Our, our, we have a million gallons total storage. Okay. So uh, that's 8 million tons, of, 8 million pounds of water, right? So, when I'm dosing, I'm using five gallons, eight gallons, right? Depending on the tank, I put somewhere between uh, the smallest tank, I put about three gallons, two and a half gallons if it's full. So as you can see, we're getting down into teaspoons, right? So um, anyway, so 120,000 uh, gallons of water is at one part per million would be a gallon of bleach, right? So uh, let's just take that down into, uh, we're gonna divide that by a, what? We wanna get it down into a hundred gallons, right? But do we wanna be drinking that bleach? I thought it also had a bunch of other additives and we should go to- Most, pool. so what I call common household bleach, don't get the scented bleach, don't get your other, but if it's just the, honestly, if it's the cheapest bleach on the shelf, that is straight just chlorine and water. There's no other scent things. There's no other detergents in it. It is just straight bleach and water. Splash. Huh? Anti-splash. Yeah. So yeah, just really, honestly, the cheapest thing on the shelf, right? Um, so um, at, at 100 gallons, I've, I've done the math on this before. It turns out that it's about to, to go like 10 parts per million is a quarter cup. Gallons is a quarter. At, so and that'll be 10 parts gallon, per million. So 50, gallon, 55 gallon, gallons is an eight, and it's still going to be at, at 10 parts per million, right? And we're trying to get down to like five parts per million. So we're looking at for the dosing of a 55 gallon drum, 
we're looking at a tablespoon or so. So there's three tablespoons and an eighth of a cup, right? Okay. So, so one huh? Two. Is it two? You're the baker. <laughs> so 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 we're looking at at about a we're looking at, at about a tablespoon or so of water in a 55 gallon drum but that's going to take some contact time right you're going to shake that up you're going to you're going to let that sit for a couple of hours um but that's how little chlorine it takes common household bleach to get it down to the the concentration yes what's that for 55 gallons how many tablespoons of bleach between one and two, oh, no. right? It's four and a four, so it's two and an eight. Glory, right? So that's what I'm thinking. It was about a, it's about a tablespoon. Oh, a fourth cup is four tablespoons. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's two tablespoons. Per and per yeah. Gallon yep. And so I would put. So that's going to be one part per million, right? So one tablespoon is one part per million. Two tablespoons is two parts per million. Here's what you don't know about the water that you've got. You don't know what the, the demand is, right? How much stuff is in there? What's the demand? So um, the maximum dose, according to EPA, no matter what, is four parts. And then you have residual. So obviously you're not gonna really wanna dose your 55 gallons of water more than about an eighth of a cup, right? And, and then your demand should be less than that. Um, but you don't have any way to test that. So uh, back to rotation, right? The more you rotate it, the better off you are. You know those big metal, they, they're they opaque with metal outsides. Is that 250 gallons in those things? Some of those are 330, I think. You're talking about those totes that you pick up with right. forklift. Those, those are about, some are 250. So it's over between 250 and three. So the largest ones I've seen are about 330 gallons. So those are, I know those are popular. One of the things that's really important that is that you limit UV, right? You don't, you want black, blue, something that, that you can keep the UV light out. Those clear ones let light in and then they grow algae, right? And most of those are reused. That's right. But I think you can buy them brand new. Never been used. I think you can purchase those brand new. I've been down to the uh, paintball store, Your Family Still Matters store, and uh, they have some tall ones that are like 250-ish gallons that fit in the corner of a, a, ha a room or something and have a little spigot on the bottom. That you can get the water out the bottom. Those are clear. So those would need to be stored in a room, dark place, right? The darker, the better. The less water, less light it gets, the better. Um, because that, that UV light will promote the algal growth, okay? And, and bacterial growth and everything. Sunlight can be a purifier. You can use UV light, um, but it's a long process. Um, the other thing that is not really on this list is distillation. Right, there are some water filters out there that use a distillation process. Um, removes all the minerals, it's just straight water at that point, um, but it's clean safe, can be used fairly quickly. So any other things we wanna cover on ideas, thoughts on purification, filtration? I, again, chlorine's the most common, there are other things out there. It's just easy to get, right? Obviously Question. The main concern is drinking water, right? You can use dirty water to flush your toilet. Yep. Or really even wash your clothes. Right. And, and so that's why when I talk about storage, right? So Come up with a quantity for each of these items down here, right? Bottled water, there's a, I'm assuming there's a life shelf on that. Well, actually, the, the shelf life on just straight bottled water, even though it's clear, is quite long because it's been. Um, they run it through a purification process before they put it in there, plus then they uh, disinfect the bottles before they seal the bottles up. So unopened, sealed, just a little, that's a great, actually, I would suggest that that is your drinking water storage plant. Mm. Doesn't it's it so absorb cheap. a lot of BPA from the plastic though? Well, it doesn't matter, right? It's already in your use of plastic for these other things, and it's, it's, 
They use a different type. It's a more brittle type rather than the soft. The softer the plastic, the more it'll absorb those um, out of the plastic. But so they use a little different formulation. So um, I really wouldn't be too concerned about that. It's such a small amount. Um, and the other thing you need to understand is when the EPA says it establishes their what we call MCLs, maximum contaminant levels of any constituent in water, it's based on someone drinking the same water from the same place for 75 years and what is their probability of getting X disease. Okay. Um, you're not, this is emergency, right? You're going to be drinking it. All we want to do is make sure that we don't get sick, right? Stomach flus, GRD is anything like that, that's going to cause health concerns and need medical attention, right? That's what we want to do is in the event of emergency, we want to be self-sufficient, not require, not do something dumb that now requires somebody to come to my rescue, right? Um, another, another thing that I always talk about is collection, right? What if in kind of a longer term um, emergency uh, and you run out of water, how are you gonna haul water, right? How are you gonna go someplace and get more water? Um, so as you think about your storage, right? Um, mobility of that storage becomes important. Um, how am I gonna haul it? Uh, I've, so, you know, some people might decide, hey, I'm gonna have a water truck. You know, I'm gonna go get a water truck, you know? Um, but the, the one thing about it is that anything that's really long-term, we're gonna come together as a community, right? Over here and work together, right? These are short-term, like I say, it might just be that you have a break in your yard and have to shut your water off for the night. And uh, what have I got if I need to get a drink of water? Um, how am I going to get a drink of water? So anyway, uh, kind of short term, but you know, less than a week, day, two days. Uh, that's really, in my opinion, 30 days water storage. If you want to do it, go ahead, but that might be a little over the top. Uh, 15 days water storage, that might be reasonable to think that 15 days, uh, if I could survive on my own for 15 days, right? Um, we had some flooding that Gunlock was greatly affected by back in 2005, six, whatever that was, right? And they had, their water comes from a spring and a well, both of which were underwater because the flood, flood of their, both of their water production sources. Um, and the water that came in the spring was not safe to drink because it was underwater. So the water that came through the spring if they opened the valve was just raw river water. Mm -hmm. At which had run down through a cow pasture. <laughs> so yeah, you're not drinking that, right? And the well was underwater and couldn't be pumped because the electrics were gone. And so now what they had in their storage tanks was what they had. And they were really concerned about what do we do? And they, so not only that, the bridge at the south washed out, the bridge at the north washed out. They, were, they couldn't, you know, the National Guard showed up with bottled water and everybody had storage. And uh, it was kind of funny, I talked to somebody who lives there and they said, yeah, when the National Guard showed up with these crates of water, they wanted to, you know, what can we do for you? And, and if that was the, the residents of, of Gunlock were asking the pilots, anything you need, can we get you a drink? Can you, they had everything they needed, right? And they were like, why are we here? And there was enough preparedness in Gunlock that for that short term, they were able to get by and, and once the, the river subsided, they were able to get the spring turned back on and, and disinfect and chlorinate and they had to waste their water, I think, that was in the tank. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very community thing, right? We're gonna pull the plug on the, on the water that's in the tank, get in there, clean it out, chlorinate it, make sure everything's good uh, because they had to have gotten some contaminated surface water through that spring box. Mm -hmm. So you don't foresee us needing more than 15 to 30 days for personal use? I wouldn't think so. And, and I, I'll tell you why. Is anything beyond about a week is no longer short term. You're going to be needing to haul, right? You're going to, you've got to have a way to go acquire water at that point, right? So you, I would suggest that somewhere between 7 and 15 days worth of storage would be adequate 
right? Because once we get beyond that, um, you're going to you're going to need to. It, there's going to be a place to go get water at that point, right? Whether the water company's hauling water in trucks, right? Because that would be one of the things that the water company would do, right? We would hire a water hauler to bring safe potable drinking water to say this building or the fire station, right? And you would come there with your jugs and fill up your water. That's why it kind of hauling water hauling becomes for a long-term plan, right? We have a short-term plan, we have a long-term plan. How safe would it be to go up to Baker Dam and get water? Uh, not, very. not very, not for drinking. Again, you if you've got purification or filtration, right? Then that's really the key, right? If I'm not drinking water, you, personal preparedness needs to center around purification, filtration. Really needs to center around that. That's the most important piece of all of what's up there, right? That's where you start. If you know, if you've got two fifty-five gallon drums of water and no purification, I'd suggest that you go for purification next, and then worry about quantity of storage, right? Um, because your two fifty-five gallon drums will take you for a couple of days, but you won't have any drinking water. Now, again, if your drinking water needs are going to be met with bottled water, and you've got got enough there of course seven, seven, seven. um but you need about a gallon per day per person for drinking water just drinking cooking right so that would be a rough place to start a gallon per day per person in the household and that is probably a bare minimum when it comes to cooking or anything like that right because that water needs to be pure usable open the bottle done right take no effort to the Berkey can kind of be, a, I would say, be a, a great backup. Hey, we've got this, but I've at least got some bottled water so that right now I can get a drink. Which reminds me I'm thirsty. Can you give me a drink? Um, in the back of my truck. Okay. <laughs> I have a question. I use sport uh, ordained protein containers. The about gallon containers have protein powder in them. Are those? Considered food grade for water? Nothing is food grade for water except new unused containers. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the difference, I'll, I'll make one caveat. If it's glass, yeah, glass, glass can be used for drinking water okay. if it's been used prior. Okay. But nothing besides glass and or clean unused plastic. Okay. Don't use anything that's had any other storage in it. But you can use it to flush it. Yeah. yeah. It, there's lots of things you can use the water for, right? And again, it, it, I come back to purification filtration, right? If you're going to purify it, but I wouldn't store that water. It's just, it's just not a good plan, right? It, there's just too many, you're entering, you're, you're, there's too much um, variability in what's in that plastic and what it's growing and whether or not the, you know, like chlorination, you know, you, when you're talking about trying to, if you're going to chlorinate a gallon of water, you're talking about a few drops of, of chlorine. Um, again, kind of back to my statement about filtration, purification, and do your homework on that. So you really kind of understand it. That's kind of a personal go home homework item. Try and understand that. You know, there's lots of information on the internet. Um, and a, a quick Google search for me led set to me to several reputable like the Berkey was one of the first ones that came up they've got a really good site and I dug a little deeper into the Berkey to look at what the filtration was and how it worked and to make sure that it wasn't a, a pseudoscience kind of uh yeah we do all this and and read some reviews read some scientific stuff and it appears that it is in fact 100% viable okay been tested they have good testing from universities that have tested the water um, for E. coli, uh, bacteria of various sorts, um, tryptosporidiums, those, you know, really harmful bacteria. So, um, and there are two or three of them out there um, that are, like I say, they're very viable. I thought, maybe, man, maybe I need to get one. Because um, right now my plan's a little water pump thing that it, it's great because I can, if the water's reasonably clean, I can get a gallon or two of water fairly quickly, quicker than a Berkey. Right, it's just a little cartridge, ceramic cartridge with a um, uh, carbon filter in the middle. You've probably seen those made by MSR, right? You can. So anyway, that's kind of my plan: is that I just have this little water pump, and if I 
had to drink something that was questionable, I can pump that out immediately. Don't have to wait for the temperature to change. To, so anyway, uh, and by far the largest water consumption when it comes to your personal storage really is going to be bathing. How do I bathe? Uh, you know, your spit baths work okay for a day or two, but um, you know, if you want to get a real bath and get your hair washed, that takes several gallons. And, and if you've got to wash some clothes of any sort, um, that can take 50. We get used to a week at a time in clothes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, again, and so the two most important things for me are filtration, purification, and hauling, collection. How am I going to collect more water? Because um, if I've got enough for a couple of days, if, if I run out, there's always going to be a place to get water. We have free flowing water in and around Diamond Valley. Um, but again, it'll need to be purified and filtered. Um, and that water runs out free onto the ground and is fairly easy to capture, even by our whole community. It would be difficult. Um, but in a real, real emergency, I suppose we could, uh, you know, I, I don't quite personally know where the sources are. I don't necessarily disclose those. But the better sources that we have water rights in, we can go take the water at, because we own the water that's coming out, right? The water company, when I say we. Okay. On collection, has there been anybody who has off their water line collected massive amount of water, we'll say a couple thousand gallons, which then fills up and then comes into their homes? So there's basically always a location. That's certainly an option. Yeah. You know you, anybody I that? don't know anybody that's done it to the scale that you're talking about. It, Roy Beard does Roy Beard. He, he has a cistern, but he does not pressure. The cistern to pressure the house so one of the things that you can do that is would do that is they make what's called a hydronomatic tank you run the culinary water into the tank right and it, the tank then pressurizes and holds 20 gallons 50 gallons 100 gallons it's a fairly expensive option but if the water were to go out you can just shut the valve on the back side right and now the, the tank is pressurized and has storage and it's been rotated. And you can just flush your toilet, you can turn on your sink, but every time you do the pressure drops in the tank, right? And so um, certainly there, uh, there are lots of options if you wanna spend a lot of money. So a water heater, 50 gallon water heater is an instant source of 50 gallons because it's got a tap at the bottom of it. And you can use that until That's it right. runs out. You can. And it's been cycled. It's, yep. it's so your water heater is another spot, right? That you in an emergency you can get some water. What about a swimming pool? Uh, swimming pools again back to water quality, right? You're constantly chlorinating that. You've got. The, I'll, I'll tell you why I would avoid a swimming pool is there's this little thing called pee, and uh, it 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 leaves behind what's called nitrates, and so you get a high nitrate content. And nitrates are not filterable and not uh, purifiable and they are harmful. So again, if you're going to wash clothes, you're going to bathe. Yeah, great for that, right? But not as a drinking water source. Do not try and use your swimming pool as your drinking water source. We and or your a cooking. salt water pool. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I don't, I don't care. Somebody's kids peeing. It's a no pee zone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's there. There's too much. Uh, there's too many variabilities. And and again, it's the nitrates that's the problem. Um, and they're not filterable. They slip through the filters. Even RO, they'll come through RO. So you cannot, you'll come to the Berkey. And that's one of the disclosures on Berkey is that we do not remove nitrates or nitrites. So um, yeah, thinking, hey, I'm gonna just use my pool water in there and make drinking water. Just don't do it. It's just not a good idea. Um, not worth it. If, I guess, suppose if you're gonna die, go ahead, right? But. Um, Certainly not a long-term solution, okay? Great for, like I say, great for bathing, great for washing clothes, great for lots of things, washing your toilet, um, lots of things that it's very useful for. So, where are we at on time, 709? Okay, are we ready to move on to the um, community? And I, I have kind of, in my opinion, um, listed these in order of likeliness, probability. 
we've had a well failure. When I talk about a well failure, I'm talking about a pump, right? We've got pump failure. That can happen and does happen. Um, and so here two years ago, uh, during the middle of the summer, on, in, on August 22nd, I remember it well. Um, it was my birthday. It was my birthday. You remember well, Peter. Uh, our, our main well failed. The pump motor went out and failed on us. And so we were limited to the water that we had on hand because we had another, we have a, a secondary well, but the electrics were not functioning properly and I couldn't turn it on immediately. I couldn't just turn it on. We had another problem that we were trying to get fixed. So at that point, we had what water we had in the tank. And small, this is the downfall of the small community water system, right? We don't have redundant sources, another pipeline that we can just turn some water on here or there, turn some valves in. Um, we are wholly reliant on what we can produce out of the ground. Um, so we had that well failure that, again, it, the tanks were near full when it failed. So we had about a million gallons of storage um, and a million gallons go a long ways as long as people turn sprinklers off. Um, if they don't, then you have what happened, which is what I did when the water level continued to drop. I went and started shutting the valves on the tanks because I knew it was, and we were feverishly working, worked pretty much all night and most of the next day and got the well restored. But I just went and started turning the valves off and, and then turned the one valve down low enough that there would be little to no pressure if everybody started to like water their lawns. How do you notify people when? So we've got, the Dime Valley Water Company has a Facebook page, right? There, it, we have also, and we haven't used it often, but we've used it a few times, and I believe we did in this instance, Fred. Mm -hmm. We have kind of a reverse dialing. It's not really reverse dialing. We have a, a text blast. We Anybody who allows the water company to have their cell phone number, you have to give it to us. We're not going to come twist your arm and take it from you. But if you want to be notified, we have it, the way to do a text blast. We can also do email blasts, which we did then as well. Mm -hmm. So we try and do several digital as well as like the text is more personal, right? It comes right to your phone. But again, if we do not have your phone number or a, um, a mobile phone for you, that you can text do, on. How do you do that if you're not on Facebook? How do you give your number to, to, to get on there? Uh, you just need to contact Megan Marnum. Megan. Yeah, make sure that she has it. Okay. Um, so I would just suggest that that you have that some we don't have everybody's and we it's not part of the process to even set up an account right um a phone number to reach you at and or it may be so old that you were the first person in the valley and was that you Lori? <laughs> <laughs> uh annette's older <laughs> um, um, not in the second war yeah so um yeah, make sure that the water company has a way to contact you via, uh, ideally, a, a cell device, right? A cell phone number. Okay. So that's kind of our number one thing. Um, just to informationally, we have operational. We right now we have two wells fully operational, um, and one well produces really enough water to meet our peak demand in the summer. I run both of the wells just to make sure that they stay good and clean and and uh anyway i run and and it helps to just meet the peak demand and i've got a third well that um is should come online this summer it was drilled a long long time ago and we finally built a building around it and we've got finally got a pump and motor in it, it as you know supply chain we've been on this project for well over a year um, it took us almost a year to get all of our electrical parts uh been extremely difficult to get those um, those parts and we had started the project before the supply chain issues but one of the things that happened with the wells in particular was we we needed five inch column tube and when the supply when the five inch column tube was all bought they didn't make anymore and so we had to wait for the column tube um, to and that took a long time long time to get the column tube and we won't go into the engineering of why we couldn't just use a six inch or use a four inch it has to do with um, the, the water flow and the velocity that we want in the pipe, we try and hit between a certain uh, feet per second velocity in the pipe. So it took a long time, uh, but we're getting really close to that well coming online. 
Uh, the next thing would be a, a, some major system, probably power, power failure would be next, right? Because we do experience some power failures. A um, couple of times a week. <laughs> oh, the other thing, how does a brownout, like there were about four little brownouts the other morning. How does that affect your, your equipment? Um, so the, the equipment is well protected, right? It's got filters on it. And so basically as soon as, once the voltage drops below, which is a brownout is the, a change in voltage, right? Mm -hmm. On the main system. Um, it, it runs within a basically 10%. So our voltage at the well, it needs 480 volts, right? So if the voltage drops below about 450 volts, um, the, the equipment just shuts off, right? It's got, it's got a protection on it. And or if it spikes over 10%, right? Because that's the UL listing of the equipment, right? Can run within 10% of its rated voltage, okay? So we protect it on either side of that with um, some fairly actually inexpensive, easy to replace equipment that doesn't go bad, right? It just gets the power. It's a simple switch that just gets the power and shuts off. And then when the bolt, it, it'll still call for water, but if the voltage is too low, it won't let it come back up. And, and if, anyway, so some, surprisingly, the most frequent thing that happens is that we lose some of our communications equipment in lightning strikes. Okay, that's a surprising, most people don't realize that, that I'll wake up in the morning and go to check the water and my communications will be down. And it'll take out a radio or it'll do, so at that point, it's not about whether or not we can get water out of the ground, it's just inconvenient for me to have to go up and turn the pumps on and do some stuff that is inconvenient while we get the communications equipment. It, one of the greatest things is that I can, from anywhere that I have an internet connection, I can find out, turn on, turn off the water system here in Diamond Valley, right? Pumps, the, all of that from this. I can monitor it, doesn't matter where I'm at. Um, but when it, it, it's, so it's great 99% of the time, but 1% of the time it's real frustrating. Uh, lose a radio, can't figure out why we don't have communications. Takes us a few days sometimes to troubleshoot it. And in those instances, I'm manually running things, right? I'm going up in the morning early or in the night late and turning what if on you pumps. you put up like an antenna and grounded it just to catch that lightning strike? They're all grounded. It just, it, it I mean, believe, you got like believe it or not, it doesn't things? have to hit the ground. Oh, really? Yeah, it's lightning because of its, mm -hmm. right? It kind of just emanates out. It, uh, so the grounds are, everything is grounded properly. Um, and it, the, the, but I was just saying like a decoy answer. My dad had a Motorola two-way right. and it always caught all the light, right. lightning strikes. Um, the, the funny thing is, is that the strikes don't have to hit the ground, don't have to hit the building, don't have to hit anything like that. Just the, um, that pulse, which Still is an electromagnetic radio. pulse, right? Right. Okay. And, and an EMP, right? We talk about the EMP bomb, right? Well, we have EMPs all the time, right? But most everything is shielded well enough that those little lightning strike pulses don't take out the electronics. Uh, certainly don't take out anything major, but we have some very fine electronics that, um, like say, that run the radios, that run, that are very susceptible to that. Um, and typically it doesn't ruin the equipment. You just have to go reset. That's 90% of the time you just go reset the equipment. You just go unplug it, plug it back in. It just kind of causes this communication glitch that it gets out of the loop, right? Um, so you just go reset it, comes right back up. Most of the time, um, that's the case. So um, as far as uh, long-term power failures, the water company's um, solution is a reliable generator with a thousand gallons of diesel fuel. Um, so we can long-term run that generator for more than a month, about 45 days on the fuel. If we ran it during, and I'm talking about peak, like July to August type peak, right? Nobody knows anything's going on. We just run this generator and use the water just like we don't care, <laughs> which is what we want. Honestly, that's what we want, right? We want to run the water like we don't care. Um, Probably not. <laughs> <laughs>
And, and uh, we obviously there's a, a big buzz with solar, whether or not that's a viable solution. Um, it's viable for Tesla, people who want to spend a whole lot of money and then you still have to have a, the grid or um, the, the voltage that we need is, and it's three phase, it's difficult to generate three phase power from a solar panel without a lot of equipment that w if we were to invest in would be likely several hundred thousand dollars for a backup that we can buy even diesel fuel at five dollars a gallon to fill that tank's only five thousand dollars right we're talking about uh, more than an acre of panels mm -hmm. to generate the kind of power that we need it's a lot and it's it's not a wise use of water company funds right how families working is it how most of them is? don't they just because solar is an interesting um animal one it produces dc power right we need ac power to a panel right the the if we could harness every ounce of energy from the sun we can get one kilowatt per meter squared so nine square feet we can get one kilowatt of power that's if we could catch every single drop of the sun's power in a solar panel right the reality is is that we're capturing about 15 percent 15 to 20 percent even at today's efficiencies which are greatly improved right I'll, my opinion about solar is solar power is better than no power but it's not a replacement for power um because when you start talking about your home and some of the stuff that you do there, you can viably, with some money, replace a lot of your power and maybe even generate enough to have a zero power bill, right? <laughs> um, over the course of a year. Uh, but what you're not realizing is that you're stealing this grid power and you're putting power back on the grid. And solar is very, um, what we call dirty. The, it does not produce a constant sine wave of power um, because the sun intensity and its and the panel's relation to the sun is constantly changing. Clouds cover the earth rotating, even the really good ones, right? You, which is what they have to have for these solar farms that the power companies are building, right? That panel constantly changing trying to find the exact angle that it needs to be so it's perpendicular to the sun's rays right and so um again you want a really reliable solar i mean we're talking to run a pump reliably is millions of dollars at that point right to get that sophisticated um and it's just again it's not a wise use of the company's funds um, as valuable as water is to us, for five thousand dollars, I keep a thousand gallons of diesel fuel and run for thirty to forty-five days, um, and okay. that's a very reliable. I can turn it on when I want in the middle of the night. Doesn't matter, right? Got about five minutes. Let's touch okay. on your um, three last topics. Okay, uh, rolling blackout back at the power contamination. So contamination would be like we talked about with a flood in a flood event if our wells some for some reason they flooded and got um ground or surface water in the well right um other sources of contamination would be some sort of a, a call it a prank i don't know a, a terrorist attack right somebody decides that they're going to go up and drop something in the tank and we don't know about it right so our tanks are locked, the accesses are locked. We, they're not all fenced. Um, you've known that kids climb on tanks and we've never had a, necessarily a problem. It's difficult, it would be difficult to do anything to contaminate the tank without intentionally wanting to go up and do it, right? Um, but contamination would be, so I do sampling monthly um, that is just, it's a, a bacteriological sample. And, and, and an E. coli sample. And our samples come back clean, which means that our system is healthy, that we don't have bacteria in there that is gonna make you sick. Um, e. coli is a pass fail. Um, and that's the one we're worried about, right? Um, e. coli will make people sick really quick. 
and in large scale. Uh, and if we were able to even get a false positive on an E. coli, it's an automatic boiler. Do not drink the water. We don't know if it's safe. Do not drink boil only. Um, so uh, we're real careful. The state comes and, and looks at our, our system um, every three years to make sure that we are meeting the guidelines that we're being safe, that the possibility for an inadvertent contamination from uh, a rodent, right? That's our biggest, believe it or not, our biggest threat is a rodent getting in there. A, a mouse falling down a well shaft, uh, a squirrel getting, crawling up a pipe someplace, right? So there's a whole um, process that we go through, like I say, every three years to make sure that our seals are tight, that our screens are on, that our air gaps that we need to have are there, all of those kinds of things, right? So to minimize and or eliminate contamination is a problem. Uh, flooding, as far as the water company and, and water resources is concerned, um, our wells are up on tops of hills, right? Um, so we do not, they're not in lowlands. Uh, so having a flood event that would, would inundate a well and cause a problem is unlikely. Um, and so, but a flood event that could affect us would be, and we've seen it before, um, where the water comes from the back detention basin over into the front one and runs across the road at Diamond Valley Drive and could wash the road out there. I've seen it. Try to wash the road out right there, in which case we have a water main that runs down there, right? And so if we had a flood event that washed a pipe out, we have the, the water lines run through the, the, um, the wash in the middle of Diamond Valley Rock mm -hmm. Hollow Wash, right? We have two water lines that both on Diamond Valley Drive and on Jade Drive that run through there. Um, if we were to lose both of those feeds, right, the all of the east or west side of Jade Drive would be out of water. But we have a back feed through the school, but it's all on the same side, right? So we could, everything from Jade Drive to school could potentially, it's on, it's all loop, but it, the tanks are up here, right? Um, and so in, in that event, we're kind of come back to a system failure, right? How quickly can we get it fixed? And I keep some parts on hand, enough parts on hand that I can do uh, most repairs um, so that those are in inventory and we could get one of the, the loops restored rather quickly if we had some major flood event that took out um, a portion of the, the water distribution system. And, and then the last one there is kind of earthquake, right? Um, and we, we live in what's called a rift valley, which means that our earthquakes are not the upheaval type where one plate comes on top of the other, where our valley is actually being ripped apart, right? Um, and that's, we know that because the cinder cone was the result of a ripping of the Earth's crust that caused a tear clear to the magma layer that then came up. And as it comes to the surface under pressure, it creates those cinder cones. So those cinder cones are, that you see all the way up SR18, right, are a result of the ripping of the Earth's crust, okay? Um, so uh, anyway, we're likely, if we had an earthquake, it's not typically, it's going to be a low magnitude, uh, which is what you've seen here in the past, right? We don't live on a fault that's a thrust fault. We live on a, an, an anticline, is I think what it's called. And so um, while there's always the possibility of somehow that, that, that fracture, that fracture seems to be the major fault line is to the west of us here, right? And then this valley has filled in with the sediment from the mountains as that valley has been ripped apart. So, um, you know, in, in California, they've got the, they've got a thrust fault, right? That's what's causing these major earthquakes that that friction, 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 then releases and and slides apart and wrecks freeways and the, the Earth's crust is heaved, right? So anyway, I'm done. Okay, Laurel.
thank you for everything that you do. We see you out early in the morning helping people with broken pipes and everything and late at night. So just know that we appreciate all that you do. And 